Hello, everybody. I'm hoping that you're here because you guys are uh, considering going to the Grand Canyon, whether or not you're going to hike it. There are a couple different ways that you can go to the Grand Canyon, the most popular being hiking, so on foot. You can also get down to the Grand Canyon by mule. You can also take a helicopter ride if you've got a lot of uh, dinero. And you can also raft the Grand Canyon uh, from beginning to end. Where is the Grand Canyon? Well, a lot of people don't actually know that it is in its entirety in the state of Arizona. You can get to it from Utah. You can get to it from Las Vegas. You can get it get to it from uh, Arizona. So. The entire canyon is with, located within the state of Arizona. The boundaries of it, you've got the Grand Canyon National Park, you've got the Kaibab National Forest, the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument, the Hualapai Indian Reservation, Havasupai Indian Reservation, and the Navajo Nation. All of those areas are kind of bits and pieces around the Grand Canyon. Oh, before we start anything, our uh, video today is sponsored by... <laughs> Happy Trails Racing! If it wasn't for these guys and their great races, we wouldn't have these cool mugs and also to the town of Fort Erie for supplying us with the water that we're drinking out of it because we're thirsty. So your distances to get to the Grand Canyon. So if you were going to the South Rim from Phoenix, it's about 372 kilometers. That's 231 miles for our, my American friends. It's gonna take you about three and a half hours to get there from Phoenix to the South Rim. The North Rim is a different story. It's a much longer distance. It's 571 kilometers, 355 miles. It's going to take you six hours to get there. Typically when we go, if we're going to the North Rim, we try to get as far as we can on the first day. A lot of times we'll stop at Vermilion Cliffs on the way, which is about 100, uh, 100 kilometers away from the South Rim. But by the time you go through Flagstaff, get groceries, you, you're tired. You know, you've been flying all day. You're tired. So we usually kind of do it in, in two steps. But you, you could you could do you it. could absolutely do it in one step. And if you're only going for like, you know, four or five days, you're gonna want to get there as fast as you can because you kinda wanna have a little bit of time to acclimatize to the altitude because and I'll mention this later on, you are at about eight thousand feet. If you're going to the north rim, you're at about seven thousand feet if you're going to the south rim. So I'm going to give you guys some cool facts. There's a couple of facts and some conflicting theories about the Grand Canyon. It is 446 kilometers long. So that's 277 miles. It starts at what's called Lee's Ferry. That's mile zero. And it ends at the Grand Wash Cliffs, which is mile 277. At its widest point, it's 29 kilometers wide. That's like, it blows your mind when you think of that. 18 miles at the widest point. And at the deepest, it's one mile deep, 1.6 kilometers deep at its deepest point. So like, think about that, guys. It's not the deepest canyon in the world. The Kalai Gandaki Gorge in Nepal is way deeper, but it's pretty deep. It's 4.17 trillion cubic meters in volume. Think about that. You would need 65 trillion people. I love this. 65 trillion people jammed in there to fill it up. That's 9,000 times our world population. And I found another funny fact, that's 80 quadrillion hot dogs. Somebody actually had that figured out and put that on there. I thought that was kind of silly, but. It's very geologically significant due to the well-preserved and exposed sequences of ancient rock. When you are going down, you it's absolutely visible, the striations and the layers as you go down, the layers change and it's unbelievable how you see the rock go from red to white to brown and Chris has got a couple of examples here that he's taken from the bottom of the canyon. So if you see that there, that is a hunk of rock from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. At the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's the oldest rock and it's actually called Vishnu Schist. So that's the oldest rock at the bottom. So here's a kind of a debated fact on, you know, how it kind of came to be. They describe it as an uplift associated with mountain formation moved these sediments thousands of feet upward, creating the Colorado Plateau. So obviously none of us were there to see this happening, so we don't know for sure. But scientists do a lot of their work trying to date this thing, and that is a huge debate on how old it actually is. The uplift of the Colorado River is uneven, so it makes it 
The North Rim is higher than the South by a thousand feet. And due to this, the temperatures are really different from the top of the canyon to the bottom. The North Rim is generally cooler than the South. The South Rim is at 7,000 feet. I said that before. The North Rim is at 8,000 feet. And the bottom of the Grand Canyon, believe it or not, is still 2,600 feet above sea level. So, I mean, you're, you're at altitude no matter where you are in the Grand Canyon. I've never noticed any sort of altitude distress or anything like that. The only time you kind of notice when we get to the North Rim, we go for a run. Yeah, you're a little bit winded, but excuse me, I've never had any headache or anything like that. As long as you drink, you know, the minute that you get to the state of Arizona, just keep drinking, drink Gatorade, drink water, pee all the time if you can. To give you a reference, sitting here in Crystal Beach tonight, we're about 600 feet above, above sea, sea level. level. So yeah, we're pretty low. Gives you an idea. Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the debated facts, it's possibly as old as 70 million years, according to appetite thermochronometry. Some of the older scientific testing had it dated at six or seven million years old, but they've since come up with better ways of testing the radiation because everything gives off radiation. The radiation that gives off dates it at about 70 million years. The fact is it is a result of erosion. The Colorado River cuts its way through. The wind blows through there and it cuts a lot of the way through. And That's like, where the arguments are is that it was, some say that it was multiple canyons that combined in to form one grand canyon. Yeah. Others say no, it was just one carved through with the, yeah, we've with the watched, Colorado. There's been a million different shows that we've watched on this and, and it's they kind of all give different stuff. But the website that I got this info was a government website. It seemed really legit. Not that government stuff is legit, but you know, I kind of read through it and it, it seemed pretty good. Again, the exposed rock at the bottom is called Vishnu Schist. It's 2 billion years old. Like think about that. You can't even think about it. You, you can't even, like that's 2 billion year old rock. The rock at the top is called Kaibab Limestone and it's about 230 million years old, which still like 230 million and 2 billion. It's, these are the numbers that you can't even get your head around. So ancestral Puebloans, the Anasazi, which translate to ancient ones, were the first to live in the canyon and they lived in cliff dwellings. And there are actually spots off the main corridor trails where you can see cliff dwellings, definitely advanced hikes where there are no water, toilets or anything like that, way deep into the canyon. But you can actually go and see these ancient dwellings where these people lived up in the cliffs. What you can see, are pictographs. So if you are on the South Rim and you go down the Bright Angel Trail, just a few hundred feet past the first tunnel, there are pictographs on your left side, if you're heading down, up on the wall of like horses and stuff. And it's the neatest thing. I had never noticed that until this time around when we went, it was the first time somebody happened to be, people were looking with binoculars at it. So we stopped and we're like, how are we looking at? And I looked through this guy's binoculars and you could actually see like you can see it from your naked eye, but it's really neat when you look through the specs and you can see it kind of magnified there. So the Grand Canyon is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. As you go down about every thousand feet, your temperature is going to increase by five and a half Fahrenheit degrees, Fahrenheit, three degrees Celsius. So keep going down, the temperature goes up. It's the most visited park of all of the national parks in the United States, the South Rim. You get 5.9 million visitors a year. Only 1% of that go down into the canyon. So if you ever go into the canyon, you're one of the 1%. That's pretty badass if you ask me. A fun fact is the most dangerous animal. What would you think is the most dangerous animal in the Grand Canyon? <clears throat> Snakes, scorpions, no. The most dangerous animal in the Grand Canyon is the rock squirrel. And the reason for this is because they are very bold and brazen and they come up to you they'll climb in your bag they want your food people feed them all the time which is a bad thing we're guilty of it because actually he was climbing into chris's bag and chris had some peanuts so he threw peanuts away from his bag so he wouldn't go in the bag but at least 12 people a year get bitten by these little bastards and so they they say that it's the most dangerous animal in the canyon so if you're going to drive from the south rim to the north rim you're looking at 346 kilometers, 215 miles, and it's a good four hours driving. The funny thing <laughs> is, it's 10 miles across, 16 kilometers, from South Rim Lodge 
to North Rim Lodge as the crow flies. So think about the vastness of the canyon when you have to take four hours to drive all the way around to get to the other side and it's only, you could torpedo yourself 10 miles across. Again, four ways to the bottom, your feet, mules, raft, helicopter. A helicopter rescue, how much do you think that is? So if you get your ass hurt at the bottom of the canyon and you gotta be helied out of there, what would you think that would cost? What did we think that would cost? Uh, a few thousand dollars. Yeah, a couple of grand. It doesn't cost anything. It is actually taxpayers' dollars that will cart your sorry ass out of the canyon, but it is the discretion of the National Park Service whether or not you are in sorry enough shape to get lifted out of there. What is not covered is, of course, your ground transportation once you're on the rim. I, I remember thinking to myself, like, oh God, whatever something happened, like how the hell would we pay for a helicopter rescue? You don't. If you're tired and don't want to climb out, they are not going to take your sorry ass out of the canyon. You need to get out on your own. And the signs all over the place say, down is optional, up is mandatory. So you got to think about that when you go down. Have out of country insurance. I mean, that's, I've had to use medical things in United States before. We have out of country insurance with our jobs. You don't pay a cent that way. It's fantastic. You'd hate to get a big bill from the States if you had to go to the hospital. So. The air quality in the canyon can be pretty bad and a lot of the times when we're, we've been there it's hazy and depending on the prevailing winds if the wind is coming from the south southwest you're going to get the california smog in there and it's going to be hazy also if it's windy there's dust a lot of the times too they there's forest fires happening a lot of them are controlled burns they do this on purpose to keep the uh, like the dead wood and stuff under control from having an out of control fire so if there's any fires around and the wind is the right direction, it's going to be kind of hazy in the canyon and that just literally falls into the bottom and can make it uh, eh, less than desirable for really good pictures. So the animals that you might see when you're in there, you can see bald eagles, the California condors we've seen. They have beaver, there's squirrels, coyotes, bobcats, and cougars are rare. Lots of mule deer, you'll see them. We saw bighorn sheep this time, which was really fun. Closer to the bottom, you're going to start getting to the tarantulas the scorpions, fire ants, there's elk, there's black bear. The two main ones that can kill you are obviously rattlesnakes and Gila monsters. Gila monsters are these great big lizards and their venom is toxic. So you get a bite, you can actually die from that. Another fact, 12 people per year around about die at the Grand Canyon. So this is heat, natural causes, suicides, drownings, and stupid selfies. I've heard a ton of times with people that are getting that selfie shot right on the edge. The Kaibab limestone that's at the top is very porous and is like a sandstone and will crack and break. And people go right to the edge, stand there, and a piece breaks off. There's a video going around on Facebook right now where somebody was taking a picture and a piece broke and they literally caught themselves on a rock just below. And she stepped back off of it. Yeah, she saved her ass and she would have been dead in a second. Yeah. Selfies are more, more common now, but yeah. they said prior to that, if you talk to the rangers, they said most deaths in the canyon were from drowning. Yeah. People go down to the bottom, they think they can swim in the Colorado and they... The current is really fast. Really they get, fast. They get pulled away, so. Yeah, you know, you're hot. You just want to kind of dip in the water. It feels so good. And you get out too far and there's undertoes and this water is just flying under there. It's so cold. It, it is very long. cold. This water comes down from the Rockies. It's glacier melt. It's ice and snow melt. And it's cold. It's, it's cold. It's deep. And don't go swimming at the bottom. Another little fact, they have pack mules. And you'll see pack mules all the time. There's mules that are taking people down. Phantom Ranch at the bottom gets all of their supplies via mule. That's their food, all their supply, their frozen stuff, all comes down by mules. And then when the mules get down there and drop all the foodstuffs and supplies, then the mules pack out garbage. They pack out the mail, which is kind of neat. And people's, you can get a duffel service if you don't feel like carrying the your rangers, crap up. All the rangers stuff. Yep, so it's kind of neat. So mules start out as pack mules, so that way they get accustomed to the canyon, they get accustomed to the trails, they get accustomed to people kind of walking around them. And once they're conditioned and kind of sound that way, then they start training to be mules carrying people. Mules do fall over the edge. And the sad thing is, is the mules are all tied together. So when one goes, it typically will pull the train in and you know, there's a few mules that will go down and uh, unfortunately, they don't make it. So helicopters will have to come in and they take out the dead mules. 
See, it's not something you'd ever want to see. I've never seen it. I don't ever want to see it, but it's uh, one of those things that happen. What's the best time of year that you should hike? So if you're going to do a rim to rim, if you're going to do any of the hikes, the best time is May, May 15th to June 1st, and then September 1st to October 31st. If you're going to go in June, July, August, your brain is going to fry from the heat. It gets hot. It is just oppressing. It's, there's sometimes there's no breeze down there. It's, it's dangerous. So they totally recommend that you don't hike in those months. I have been at the Canyon in June. I did a hike down from the North Rim down to Roaring Springs Falls. It was bloody hot, let me tell you. And you just got to kind of find the shade wherever you can. It's not the best time to go. We've been now both in mid-May and the end of October. They were fantastic. Temperature-wise, it was great. In May, we got the rain, which really sucked. It was cold. But you know what? I'd rather be cold than hot. When we went in October, again, it was really cold at the top. It was perfect at the bottom. We didn't have any precipitation this time. It was just really good. You can do it all year. You can do a rim to rim all year. It'd be really tough to do it in the winter because you'd have to do a rim to rim to rim. So you start the south, get to the north and come back to the south, which that takes a lot of training. That's like a lot of work That'd to do tough. that. Be really tough. And if you're going to camp on the north rim, it's it's like Alaska up there. It's going to be snow. You've got to find a spot. You've got to be carrying all your stuff. The road to the North Rim closes officially December 1st, unless they get a snowstorm before then, they're going to close it before then. It does not reopen until May 15th. So you can only get as far as Jacob Lake, which is about 45 miles from the North Rim. So, I mean, if you want to be a hero, you can park at Jacob Lake and you can hike your ass 45 miles to the edge of the Grand Canyon and go down. Have fun with that. That uh, would be pretty brutal. The North Rim Lodge closes on October 15th, so you kind of lose some restaurant things there because they, it, you know, it's nice to get something to eat at the North Rim Lodge or stay at the North Rim Lodge, which is, I've never done that, but man, the cabins are gorgeous. The campground stays open until October 31st, but the shower and the store do close, same as the North Rim Lodge, they close October 15th. So if you're going to be up there for a few days, you're going to be stinky. They still do have bathrooms open. You can use that. They still do have potable water that you can fill up your water stores with. You just don't have like the showers in the store and, and the showers are great when they're open and the store is really fun too because there's a little cafe in there and they have all kinds of stuff you can buy. In the summertime, the temperature can get to and surpass 38 C. That's 100 F at the bottom. So that's between June and August. It is like a microwave at the bottom. And if you're going to do, like I said, if you're going to do a rim to rim in the winter, it's got to be a rim to rim to rim because you cannot get a vehicle in and out of the North Rim from December 1st on. Also, if you're going to do, even if you're going to do hikes down just the south side in the wintertime, you should have crampons with you because it does snow at the South Rim too. It's open all year round. People are still going down in the trails all year round and the crampons will save you because it does get icy and as people walk, it packs it down and makes it really slick. First couple miles. Yeah. And then it gets muddy. And then it's muddy and then it's, it and starts it's... to dry off. So how are you gonna get to Grand Canyon? Well, fly in Phoenix, fly into Flagstaff. It's more expensive to fly into Flagstaff, but it's closer. Fly into Phoenix, that's typically what we do. You rent a car, you can actually take a bus. If you don't want to drive, I suggest renting a car. It's 300 bucks. If you can rent it through Costco, it's not a problem at all. We typically will rent a van and we bring our camping equipment and sleep with our uh, air mattress and stuff. Unlimited mileage. And yeah, it's unlimited mileage. They're really good. So there are a ton of lodging options. So at the South Rim, if you don't want to stay within the Grand Canyon National Park, it's a little bit cheaper if you stay in a town it's called Tucson. There are like the Holiday Inns and stuff like that, quite a few hotels down there. There are lots of lodges at the South Rim and there's campground. So you can stay at Tucson or you can stay in Grand Canyon Village at their lodges. They also have campgrounds oh at the South Rim. At the North Rim, you can stay in Jacob Lake, which is open year round. It's really cute there. They got cabins. During May, from May 15th, to October 15th, you can stay at the North Rim Lodge and you can stay May 15th, October 31st at the North Rim Campground. So lodges at the South Rim, we have stayed at the Bright Angel Lodge 
proper. So at the main lodge, we've also stayed at the Bright Angel Lodge cabins. All of them are awesome. They're cozy. They're very rustic, all like wood beams and high ceilings, and they're just cozy. So if you stay at the main lodge, you're looking at about 116 a night. This is US dollar, 150 Canadian roughly. So that's the main lodge. Obviously you got your bathrooms and all that stuff in there. They all have a Keurig coffee makers, which is a, a nice touch. So that's the main lodge. If you want to stay in one of the cabins, they have off rim cabins, which are about 179 a night US and the on the rim. I mean, we have stayed, you can literally spit into the Grand Canyon. That's how close you are in these cabins. And they're about $200 US a night. So you're looking at 250, 260. So that's Bright Angel. El Tovar is the high end. That is the Richie Rich. It's like 270 US a night for a standard room. A deluxe room is 446. And a suite with a balcony, which obviously would be wicked cool, is 618 US dollars. A little too rich for my taste, no thanks. And all of these that I'm telling you right now are on considered on the rim. Kachina Lodge is about 258 US a night. Thunderbird Lodge is 250 at night. So Bright Angel, El Tovar, Kachina, and Thunderbird are all bing, 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 right in a row. And then you've got two other lodges that are kind of off. They're not on the rim and they're just kind of a ways away in the Grand Canyon Village. You got your Maswick Lodge, $254 US a night, and Yavapai Lodge, which is $109 US a night. So that's the cheapest one. But for me, you're coming out of the Grand Canyon. I don't want to be thinking about getting my butt to one of the lodges that are not. I want to literally crawl out of the canyon and crawl into bed. So I will pay the few extra dollars to have the hotel right there. Not only that, but the restaurant that is in the Bright Angel Lodge is delicious. They've got some really good food. And reasonably priced. And reasonably priced, yeah. These rooms are hard to get. They book up really far in advance. So, except if you check cancellations, which is what I do. I was able to get rooms the day before. You go onto the website, put in your dates that you want available, it'll come up. You can't get these things through Expedia or booking.com. You actually have to go to the Zantara website. That is the main website for booking these hotels for the South Rim and some other um, parks in the US. And like I said, these book months in advance. So if you want something concrete, and you, you know, like next year sometime, next October, book it now. That way you don't have to worry about it, but rest assured that you can still check the cancellations because the great thing about Zantara is that you get a refund if you cancel your booking within 24 hours. And people will do that because they want their money back. Your deposit for the room is your first night. So if you're staying five nights, you have to pay in full your first night. So, you know, if you're paying 200 US dollars, you're gonna want that back. So if you're gonna cancel, you're gonna cancel and people do all the time. So what I do is, so when we did Grand Canyon just last month, it was a last minute thing. I was like, holy crap, you know, I got to get a room on the South Rim. So I started looking at cancellations and one would show up at the Yavapai Lodge. So I was like, I don't want to stay there, but you know what? Worst case, if nothing else comes up, we've got that. I booked it. So I would keep checking, keep checking, keep checking. And then Kachina came up, which again, I don't really want Kachina because it was a little bit more money, but you know what? At least it's on the rim now. So I booked Kachina, I canceled Yavapai. Within two days, I had my refund back in my account from Yavapai, that was perfect. So I was like, oh, you know what, I still, I want Bright Angel. I kept looking, I kept looking, I kept looking. Two days before we left, boom, there's a cancellation at Bright Angel. I booked it, I got a refund for Kachina, and then Bob's your uncle. And we actually got the rim cabin. It was fantastic. It was so close to the rim, beautiful cabin, loved it. So. It's great that they offer a refund policy like that because people will, they know it's going to get booked. So people will cancel and get their money back and it gives other people an opportunity to get the rooms that they want. Tons of restaurants at the South Rim. So the Bright Angel Lodge restaurant is called the Harvey House. Fantastic prices. Like we both ate meals for under 30 bucks. This is US. A lot of restaurants around here, you can't even eat that. So Chris had the being as we're vegan, he had the Beyond Meat burger and fries and a drink. I had a, a salad and I had nachos and guac and a drink. And again, it was under 30 bucks. Breakfast, we had a oh, huevos rancheros, it was so good. Minus the huevos, which is eggs. So basically it's like a breakfast burrito and it was good. And that, that was 22 bucks. That was your coffee, juice, whatever, it was really good. You also have 
at the Bright Angel Lodge, kind of off to the side of it is the Arizona Steakhouse. I've never eaten there, so I don't know what that's like. El Tovar Hotel has the El Tovar dining room. That's expensive and it's dress code. So you have to reserve and wear nice clothes. And when we're running through the canyon, we don't have nice clothes. So there's no way we're going to be going there. Down at the Yavapai Lodge, they have a tavern and a dining hall. And then at Maswick, they have a food court. You're going to get your typical fries, burgers, hot dogs, pizza. I mean, it's good if you're staying at the Maswick Lodge. So at the North Rim, you got the main dining hall at the North Rim Lodge. This is when it's open from May 15 to October 15. The main restaurant, it's reservation only. It looks pretty hoity-toity. We didn't eat in the restaurant, but I looked at the menus and it was astronomical or anything. They do have like a canteen off to the side where you can get pizza, burgers, hot dogs, really good soup, salads, all that sort of stuff. You don't need reservations for that, obviously. That was really good. And at the North Rim camp store they had a little cafe in there where they had sandwiches and there's a little coffee shop at the north rim lodge too another separate one where they have little baked goods and lattes and stuff and it's it's nice it's really good so how are you going to get around when you're at the grand canyon well when you're at the south rim they you have to pay a 35 dollars park entry fee that's $35 US. If you are a military service person, it's not as expensive. I don't know what that rate is, but your main rate is $35. And that money goes to awesome things like the Grand Canyon Village shuttle bus, which is free of charge. It picks you up right outside the Bright Angel Lodge and it'll cart your ass all the way around the park. It's kind of fun to even just sit on it just to kind of tour around. They have two lines. They have the blue line and the red line and the orange line, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the blue line is the main loop. So you're gonna to go to Bright Angel, you're gonna to go to Maswick, you're gonna to go to the visitor center. They have uh, a bunch of different, the- um, There's the Outback, the Outback offices. Yeah, the uh, ranger the, offices, the like for ground, permits, the campground. General store and bank. Yep, the bank and everything, it takes you all the way around. They also have the red line, which takes you, the stop after Bright Angel, you get a transfer onto the red line and that is where you get to see your sunsets at Hermit Rest, Hopi Point, all that stuff. So you take that bus, you know, especially in the evening when it's a sunset, it's packed. So you gotta be ready to uh, get on there because everybody wants to get sunset pictures when you take that bus. And the orange line is the bus that's gonna take you to the South Kaibab Trailhead, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's the hiker bus to get out there to start your hikes there, which it starts at 5 a.m. I believe, yeah. Yeah, the shuttle has been great. So again, if you don't get your reservation at the end of the trail at Bright Angel and you are staying at Maswick or Yavapai, you can get on that shuttle bus and it'll take you right to those hotel options there. And it's free. So again, your park passes are going towards some really good things. So if you need to get from the South Rim to the North Rim, so say you're starting a hike from the North Rim, you're going across to the South Rim and you gotta get back to your vehicle and your camp stuff, you take Trans Canyon shuttle. And they are fantastic. They are accommodating. They're $90 US per person. They cart your sorry butt and your luggage or your packs and stuff from the South Rim to the North Rim. It leaves at 8 a.m. from the Bright Angel Lodge. It gets to the North Rim by noon. It's a four hour ride, remember, because it's 215 miles across. It'll stop twice on the way for a pee break and some snacks at two of the gas stations. You can have a shuttle your stuff from the South Rim down to Phantom Ranch. If you're camping down there and you don't wanna carry your crap, you're gonna pay $75 each way. So $75 down, $75 up, and a mule is gonna take your bag down to Phantom Ranch for you. So if you're gonna camp at Bright Angel Campground or if you're gonna sleep down at Phantom, you don't have to carry your stuff. There are limits to this. It can't be over 30 pounds. It's gotta be 36 inches by 20 inches by 13 inches, or it won't fit in the, the special bags that the mules have on their backs to carry your stuff down. And like I said, it's only going to Phantom Ranch. Okay, <clears throat> so we're getting to the good part now, your trail options. So try. you can go from the Bright Angel Trail down to Phantom Ranch, that is 15 and a half kilometers one way. You go down 4,314 feet from Bright Angel to Phantom Ranch. If you want, and this is from the South Rim, Bright Angel is the South Rim, South Kaibab is the South Rim. If you wanna take the South Kaibab Trail down to Phantom Ranch, it is 11 and a half kilometers, 4,654 feet. So it's a little bit higher over at South Kaibab than it is at Bright Angel, 
but it's a little bit less distance. A lot of people will take the South Kaibab down because they want to cut distance off of their hikes. The one thing about South Kaibab Trail, there is no water on it. There's toilets, but there is no water. So you better stock up. And it's pretty steep, but it's beautiful. We were saying today that we, we need to do South Kaibab more because man, the views, like it's incredible, the views from South Kaibab. I mean, Bright Angel is gorgeous too, but you're kind of in between the rocks when you're going down. Whereas South Kaibab, it's the absolute opposite. You're on a ridge the whole time, jutting out into the canyon. So the views are incredible. Yeah. The North Kaibab Trail. So now this is the North Rim. So if you're going to take the North Kaibab Trail down to Phantom Ranch, you're looking at 22 kilometers down one way. That is 5,714 feet down. So you lose that much elevation. If you want to do, so say it is wintertime and you're visiting, you want to do same side rim to rim hike. So rim to river or back. You can take the South Kaibab down to the river and come back up Bright Angel. Or you can do it in reverse, go Bright Angel down, go down to the river and come back up South Kaibab. That is a lot steeper and there's no water doing it that way. It's better to do South Kaibab down to the river and back up Bright Angel. If you're gonna take that route, you're looking at 28 kilometers total, okay? So South Kaibab down to the river, back up Bright Angel, 28 kilometers. You are going down 4,700 feet, coming back up 4,285 feet. This is a stop at Phantom Ranch. Phantom Ranch adds a kilometer and a half, but it's worth it because you have a canteen, you've got cold lemonade, there's chips, snacks, bars, you can sit down, relax, you can fill your water, especially if you're coming down the South Kaibab Trail where there is no water to fill up, you need to fill up that water. And you meet a lot of people there. Yo, know, you totally meet a lot of people. It's great just to have that break. There's picnic tables, there's shade, it's beautiful. You don't have to go that way though to get water because there is water at the Bright Angel Campground, which is if you were just to take along the river and back, you go over two bridges, you go over the Black Bridge when you're coming down South Kaibab, you come back across down the Colorado River a little bit more on the Silver Bridge. Yeah, so I mean, it's 26 and a half kilometers, 16 and a half miles if you don't go to Phantom, but go to Phantom. It's just so fun. And then once you go down there, you can see all the cabins and stuff. And then you can see, oh, you know what? I want to stay here one day because it's really, really cute down there. If you don't want to go down to the river, you can take the South Kaibab down to the Tonto Trail, which when you get to what's called the tip-off, there's the junction of the Tonto Trail, which kind of goes along the river and you're still up a couple thousand feet and pick up the Bright Angel Trail back up. So if you're doing that, you're looking at 22.2 kilometers, 13.8 miles. You go down 3,200 feet, you come back up 2860 feet. So it's a little bit less climbing, a little bit shorter distance. The Tonto Trail is not a main corridor trail. So the chances of you seeing another person on this stretch, I think it was 4.6 miles of Tonto. So you possibly could get that solitude experience of having no one else in the Grand Canyon with you, which is neat because Kaibabs, both Kaibab trails and Bright Angel are very heavily trafficked. If that makes you feel safer, that's good because you it's not like you're going to be alone for very long. There's either somebody coming up behind you, you're catching up to somebody ahead of you. There's just a lot of people there. So if you're going to do a full rim to rim from the north to the south is way better because north is higher and steeper. South is not as high and a little less steep if you're taking South Kaibab, a lot less steep if you're taking Bright Angel. So if you're gonna do a southbound via the Bright Angel Trail, so you come down North Kaibab, go back up Bright Angel, that is 37.8 kilometers, 23.5 miles. You go down 5,761 feet and you're coming back up 4,380 feet. It's a long way. If you want to take a little bit of distance off of that and you want to go down North Kaibab and come up South Kaibab, it's only 33.6 kilometers or 20.9 miles. So you got a difference of like 4K there. You're going down 5761 feet, up 4654 feet. So you're actually going up a little bit higher again than Bright Angel because South Kaibab trailhead is a little bit higher. But remember, South Kaibab has no water. So you better be darn sure that you're filled up at Phantom before you go up because you're not going to get any water going up there and you are in the full sun 90% of the time because of how it's an outcrop, like a little inlet, like a bay, but with no water. For your first rim to rim, I highly suggest you go southbound 
People do go northbound though, especially if you're gonna do a rim to rim and back. And north rim, I'm telling you, because I have done the north rim down to Roaring Springs, which is pretty close to the bottom and have come back up that way. And it is hella steep. And you just like, oh, by the time you get to the top, it's very steep. The Bright Angel has a lot of switchbacks, so it's not nearly as steep. So I'm just going to go through real quick some of the amenities on the trail. And when I say amenities, I don't mean stores or snack bars or anything like that. I'm talking about water and toilets. And so if you're coming down the North Kaibab Trail, you are going to have water seasonally. So when I say seasonal, it means May 15 to October 15. So anytime I say seasonal, May 15, October 15. Supai Tunnel, which is 3.2 kilometers down, two miles. That's seasonal water and toilets. So if you're going in the wintertime, there's no water, but there's toilets. Roaring Springs, you have to detour off to get to Roaring Springs, and that's 4.7 miles down, 7.3. Seasonal water, again, it's not there in the winter, but there's toilets there. Don't bother going to Roaring Springs, though, because not even a mile later, you get to Manzanita, and they have water year-round. Now, okay, I'm going to say something right here. When I say year-round, it's not guaranteed check the websites they have water line breaks and when there's a water line break there's no water okay and they'll tell you that it'll be a warning on there so sections of the water pipe will be not working and you don't want to be caught with your pants down without water they'll say like bring something to treat because you've got the little colorado river you've got bright angel creek you've got the waterfalls and stuff like that where you can get water but you have to treat it don't just drink it all of the water that comes out of a tap at the Grand Canyon is potable. You can drink it, you're not gonna get sick. All of the water actually comes from Roaring Springs waterfall. It's filtered and cleaned and everything like that before it gets to the tap, but it's all clean water. You don't have to worry about drinking anything out of the tap, but if you're dipping into a creek or a waterfall, treat it, because you don't wanna get giardia. That's just not a fun thing. Yeah, so Manzanita has water year round. It has toilets, cottonwood campground, seasonal. Again, so between May 15 and October 15, there are, is no water there. They do have toilets. So toilets are year round. They're not going to close those. Uh, they're gross sometimes. Let me tell you in my, if you saw any of our videos that are on YouTube of our hike down, which I, you know, I suggest you watch them because we got some really nice footage. Toilets are nasty. <laughs> Cottonwood. Yes. Yeah, so seasonal water there. Toilets, Phantom Ranch. You've got water year round. You've got toilets. You can reserve a meal if you want to have supper down there. They, their food is delicious. We had the vegetarian chili and it came with baked potato carrots obviously we can't eat any of the meat and stuff so it was delicious it was about 35 bucks for our vegetarian meal if you want a steak dinner it's 60 dollars but i'm going to tell you how hungry you are you will pay a thousand dollars for a steak at that point and let me tell you it even to us that don't eat meat it smelled fantastic they also have a canteen like i mentioned already you can get cold lemonade you can get granola bars you can get chips candy all kinds of junky stuff like that and then the last spot that you can get water and it's year round and toilets is at the Bright Angel Campground, which is just before you're gonna cross over the Colorado and start heading up Bright Angel Trail. So South Kaibab, there is no water. I said that already. There is no water on the South Kaibab Trail, nothing. There's not even a trickle of anything. If it's rained and there's a puddle, you can treat that and drink it, but you're gonna be thirsty till you get to the bottom. There are toilets in two spots. That's at Cedar Ridge, which is a mile and a half down, 2.4K. And at the tip off where the Tonto Trail again intersects, that's 4.4 miles down or 7.1 kilometers. Bright Angel Trail, as you're going down, you've got the mile and a half rest house at 1.6 miles, 2.6K. Seasonal water, again, May 15, October 15, and toilets. You got the three mile rest house at 5K seasonal water again and toilets indian garden that's 4.8 miles down 7.7 kilometers you have year-round water and toilets and the river rest house which is right before you get down to the colorado river that's eight miles down or 12.9 k there's no water but there's toilets so that's good to know So you've got some camping options. So some people want to not do a rim to rim in one fell swoop. They want to kind of take their time. They actually say that if you want to do a rim to rim, do it over four days. So what you could do is if you're coming southbound, you would camp at the north rim. 
you would camp at Cottonwood, you would camp at Bright Angel, and then you would camp at Indian Garden. So let's see, that's Cottonwood, Bright Angel Camp, Indian Garden, and out. So four days. If you want to see it and enjoy it, that is like an awesome way to go. And plus it cuts the distance down. Thing is, if you're going to camp within the Grand Canyon, you have to have a permit. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. If you try and squat camp off the trail somewhere, not in a designated campground, you are gonna get a fine and you're gonna get your ass kicked out of there by the rangers. The rangers do patrol it and you're gonna get a lot of trouble. So to get a permit, it is a lottery system, okay? It's a random draw and you need to put in your permit request four months and 10 days before the month that you wanna hike. So for example, if you want to go down into the Grand Canyon sometime in January 2020, you needed to put your permit in between August 20th and September 1st of 2019. So four months, 10 days before you go down. It's $10 per permit. So if you're going to Cottonwood, Bright Angel, Indian Garden, that's 30 bucks. That's three separate lottery systems. You have to put in for all three of those separate. And again, so it's about three. It's a random draw. It takes three weeks to process it. The good thing is, is you can get cancellations because people do cancel, they do refund permits up to the day of, from what I understand. So people will cancel and you can get lucky. And that would be really cool. I, I would like to do that one time. I think it would be really fun to just really lollygag our way through, see stuff, take little side hikes and stuff because usually we're gunning, trying to get down and out. So those are all your inner canyon options. They all need permits. It's all a lottery system. Your above rim options, you don't need a permit. You can call and reserve. You should reserve as soon as you know. You can reserve up to six months out and it does fill fast. So you're looking at the North Rim Campground. It's about 18 to $25 per night and it's reservation only. One thing though, for 2020, they are doing some waterline repairs. So. If you want to camp at North Rim Campground, it is first come, first serve only between the dates of May 15 when they open to August 31st. There will be no reservations online at all. Again, so they're doing the waterline repair. This could be good. This could be bad. For me, I would think that people are going to be really leery of just trying to show up and hope that they're going to get a campsite so they just won't go at all. For me, I, it's like, hey, you know what? Maybe there'll be more options. There are options to camp boondock camping outside of the Grand Canyon National Park. So if you just kind of come outside, there are forest roads within the Kaibab National Forest that you can camp and it's free. There's no toilets or anything like that, obviously, but you can, there are campsites that you can go to. So if you get, you know, if you're out of luck, you don't get a campsite at the North Rim Campground, you can always camp off of the Grand Canyon National Park property. And again, so it's open May 15th to October 31st at the North Rim Campground. At the South Rim, there's Mather Campground, and it's open year round. It's $18 a site, reservation only. Again, you can book six months out. As soon as you know your date, try and get a booking, and you can still look at cancellations. There's another campground called the Desert View. It's at the East Park entrance, so there's two entrances to the South Rim. You can come in from the east when you're taking 89 to Tuba City, or you can come in south side of the Grand Canyon National Park as well. So the east side, there's Desert View Campground. It is first come, first serve only. It usually fills up by noon and it's open from April 15th to October 15th. It's $12 a site. So you wanna stay at Phantom. I wanted to stay at Phantom and didn't think I ever would. I'll tell you about that in a second. Phantom Ranch is, again, a lottery. It is 15 months prior to your desired month that you have to put in the lottery. So if you want to stay at Phantom Ranch in November of 2020, you need to enter into the draw from October 1st to October 25th of 2019. So it's already passed. So if you wanted to stay any time next year, you're shit out of luck. Now you can look for cancellations and that's what I did. 45 days out from your arrival date at Phantom Ranch, you can get a refund. So around that 45th day, so the 43rd, 44th day, 
If people are like, eh, I don't think I'm going to make it, they are going to cancel around those dates because they want their money back. Again, you have to pay for the first night as your deposit. So if you're staying for three nights and it's $200 a night, you're going to have to pay at least $200. You're going to want that back if you couldn't stay. By the grace of God, the person that canceled the cabin that we stayed in probably knew how hard it is to get in. They canceled at the last minute. They did not get a refund, but they thought, you know what? Let's give somebody else a chance. And thank God they did because we got a cancellation like a couple of days before we left for Arizona. And that was a bloody miracle. So yeah, it's not impossible. And how I did it is I checked every half an hour on the Zantara website. I put in a range of dates, which it doesn't really matter because it brings up the whole month and it, you'll see the availabilities come up in the entire month when they do come up. I looked for both a cabin and a dorm. They have dormitory options and cabin options at the bottom. The dormitories, they're not co-ed. So they have a men's dorm and the ladies dorm, or they have the cabins, which um, we had one queen bed in ours, but you can get two sets of bunk beds so you could fit four people in the cabins. So they do have those options. I was checking both and we would have taken the dorms if it came up, but we got lucky and got a cabin. Originally, we had the double sets of bunk beds and they actually called us up the day before and said, hey, uh, we see that it's just two of you going down there. Would you be willing to switch your two sets of bunk beds to one queen bed? And we're like, hell yeah. Obviously, somebody else had canceled and they were trying to make do for people that needed four beds and it worked out really well. So we were really happy about that. So again, Phantom Ranch, you need to apply 15 months ahead of time. You will know by the 14th month prior whether or not you got it, you'll be notified. Thousands of people are trying to get to these cabins and dorms. So now that they do the random draw, it's kind of fair, right? It's fair to everybody. So what do you wear? When you're hiking, well, depends on the time of year. We have been in the canyon in March. We've been in the canyon in April. We've been in the canyon in May, in June, in October. So <laughs> in the early spring months, it is cold as hell at the top. I'm talking freezing, near freezing. Typically, we would wear a tank top with a long sleeve shirt over top and a windbreaker over top of that, and then shorts, or I wear a running skirt. And that's because you can strip. And as you get down within the first mile, mile and a half, you're already taking layers off. These things are small enough to pack into your, we typically wear an ultra vest, which is a very small backpack. So you can stuff that stuff in your backpack. In the summertime, obviously, you'd just be starting right out in a tank top and shorts. It's all dependent on the time of year. do you pack in your pack? Well, again, if you're camping, you're carrying a big bag and that's going to have some weight. So if you're going to be camping at Bright Angel Camp or Indian Garden or Cottonwood, you're going to need your tent, your sleeping bag, sleeping pad, food, water and electrolytes, socks, some few pieces of clothing and your camp stove. So, I mean, you're looking at 25-ish pounds. So you got to remember, you're carrying this pack back uphill with 25 pounds in it. That's a little harder. And so if you're gonna do a rim to rim nonstop, like we have, we have those ultimate direction ultra vests that has a bladder and a little bit of space. So we, when we did our rim to rim in May, we literally had a little baggie with fresh underwear, fresh socks and deodorant because we knew when we got up to the South Rim that we were gonna buy like the souvenir hoodie. And, you know, we would just kind of wash our shorts and stuff out in the sink and then like it's quick dry clothes right so it's going to be dry by the next day <laughs> it was really cold though because when we went to catch our shuttle back to the north rim the next morning it had snowed i'm in shorts and a like a long sleeve shirt which they didn't end up having hoodies because we wanted the rim to rim hoodie as our gift to ourselves for completing it but they didn't they just had long sleeve t-shirts so we were free so this time around, we had a little bit more space in our bag because we had backpacks because we were sleeping down at Phantom Ranch. So we had a little bit more stuff. I still went and bought pants at the gift shop because I was like, oh, I just want to be cozy on the shuttle ride back to the North Rim. So if you're going nonstop, 
you need food, you need water, electrolyte, a jacket, and a change of undies. So, and that's, you know, a little bit less if it's the summertime. So what do you eat and drink when you're doing this? Well, I'm gonna tell you something right now. If you just drink water, you're gonna get sick, especially if it's hot, because water is going to deplete your salt in your body and it's called hyponatremia and that can actually kill you. You can die much faster by diluting the salt in your body than you can by oversalting yourself. If you oversalt yourself, you're just gonna get grossly puffy, you'll be nauseous, whatever. So you're better off to be over salty than under salty. Use electrolyte when it's hot. Noon, goo. I hate Gatorade because it's just so, it's like pop. But anything like that is good. Um, and eat salty snacks. If you want to be eating junk food, this is the best time to eat junk food. And it's totally justified because the calories that you're burning are so immense because of altitude and just the work that you're doing, climbing uphill, climbing downhill. Eat the chips, eat the peanuts, eat all of the high fat proteiny things. You will lose your thirst and hunger. Altitude does that. I lose it very quickly. Do you get hungry? Uh, Thirsty? This, this <clears throat> Everybody's did, different. Yeah, this time I did. Yeah, I'm typically not hungry ever. And I, like, I almost am nauseous by the time we're done because I'm just so sick of Gatorade and just sick of forcing stuff into me to keep alive and I just don't want to be putting anything in my body anymore. But altitude's tricky, it'll do that to you. So what I do is I will drink, like I have my watch on and I have it set to beep every kilometer because you won't even be thinking about it. So every kilometer I drink and every rest stop, which is like every couple of miles, I'll eat something. Just because you don't want to get behind on your calories and your hydration. If you're peeing often, that is a good thing. Because let me tell you, if you're not peeing and you're in the desert, you're gonna die. How do you train for this? Well, give yourself three months. I think that would be ideal. If you're gonna do a full rim to rim, consider being able to walk like 30 kilometers before you go, if you're doing a full rim to rim. It, you'll just, it, you'll feel so much better it's harder to enjoy it when you're in the pain cave. This time around, we did very little training for it and man, you felt it. And you felt it the next day. It was like, it hurt. When we did it in May, we were trained to a T. I mean, even though the downhill still hurt, the uphill felt like nothing, it was effortless. It was fantastic until the rain and the cold got us and we started getting hypothermic and that really sucked. So do hills, like wherever you live, for me, and Chris, we live with the Niagara Escarpment. We have lots of options for hills. We did Hydro Hill several times a week. We got up to 10 times. So you go up and down Hydro Hill, which is over a kilometer to go up and back. So you're putting a lot of vertical in and that really helped a lot. If you don't have hills where you live, do stairs. Go to an arena, some stadium or anything where there's stairs. Go to the gym, do the Stairmaster. Anything that you can prep your legs for going up and down, it's kind of hard on a Stairmaster to get you down. Like you really, the downhill, I'm gonna tell you, kicks the living shit out of your legs yeah. more than the uphill. I don't think that you can really train much for that downhill. It, it just sucks. And when you're doing these hikes, I cannot stress enough, get hiking poles. Two, because it saves your bacon. And if you're gonna do hiking poles in your hike, train with those poles because your arms will be hella hurting if you're not used to using those poles because those poles are gonna be your crutches getting you back uphill after a certain amount of time when you start getting tired. Trekking poles, it's funny because you see these people that are like, ah, I don't need poles or whatever. And when you are passing them going up and you see the hurt in their eyes and they're looking at your poles drooling, going, I wish I would have brought those. You're gonna be so thankful that you have poles. I, you can't even imagine. How do you recover? You've done this great big feat, whether or not you've done a full rim to rim, you've gone down to the river and back, you've gone down to Tano and back. It's an incredible feat 
any one of those options. So now you need to recover after you've done all this. Well, eat all the things. Give yourself a hot bath. You know what, and you're gonna hate to hear this, but the best way to recover is to walk after. <laughs> because if you can kind of walk around as slow as it is that you're walking, walking is going to heal you quicker than anything. You just gotta keep moving. It's like a rusty joint on metal. If you don't move that joint, it's gonna rust up and be seized up. So the more you walk, the more lubricated your joints are gonna be. If you can have a hot bath when you're done, man, that's probably the best thing. And then, you know, if you're a runner or if you do any kind of sport activities, give yourself a good week. I'm telling you, it's been a month now. I still feel it in my hips. If I'm going up and down stairs, I still feel that fatigue in my hips just from such tremendous loss and gain of vertical. So let's get to the fun part, which is the rewards, because you need to reward yourself. There's gift shops everywhere. This stuff is not that expensive compared to the crap you get in Niagara Falls for $400. So I'm gonna show you, this is what, this is the shirt that didn't keep us warm after we did the Grand Canyon. We were hoping for hoodies. But so I got this long sleeve t-shirt and on the back it says rim to rim. It's a really cool shirt. I think this was 30 bucks US. Not bad, right? You're gonna pay that for a shirt anyways. And you can get the stickers for your car. I like stickers on my car. So there we go, Kaibab National Forest for the North Rim. Then it also, I got the Rim to Rim 2019, North South. I don't know what price might even be on the back. No, it's not. I think they were a couple bucks each, but get yourself, treat yourself. It's, you know, you've done an incredible thing reward yourself. We went on a website, or I did, this was a surprise to Chris. And they actually, so it's a trail website that has all the medals for the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and the Rim to Rim, and I got us a medal. So I awarded Chris with this medal when we did it in May. It's just a cool thing, right? Why not? Oh, another thing I wanna show you too. So when you get to the Grand Canyon, you can either get the pass when you get there, or you can actually buy a pass at REI when you're there. I buy the annual pass because we go a couple times a year, right? So this is about 80 bucks, it says right on there, annual pass. It's good for one year. So mine expires next May of 2020. So we can go and do another Grand Canyon hike up until the end of May next year. You, you kind of go through the fast lane when you got one of these because it hangs in your car, in your windshield like that, and they just wave you through. So that gets you in both north and south sides. All right, how much did this cost? So based on five days in Arizona and you wanna do a rim to rim nonstop, so you're gonna do it all in one day, you're looking at about $1,700 Canadian. You can do it a little bit cheaper. Sometimes, yeah, this is per person. So 1700 per person. Sometimes you can get cheap flights. So I put down 500-ish Canadian return from Toronto to Phoenix. Um, I've seen those flights as low as $300 return. I have a car rental here through Costco, 300 Canadian for like, a little car. And it's not at the airport car rental. If you're going to get a car, don't get it at the airport because you pay a humongous airport tax on that. It's much more expensive if you're getting a car. We got a van, it's actually the same price if you got the van off site at uh, another car rental or if you got it at the airport. So we just got it at the airport. You're looking at about 46 Canadian for your park pass. If you're camping for a couple of nights, so if you're going for five days up to the North Rim, you're gonna have your first night, so your travel day, your first night you're staying at the campground. The next night you're gonna stay at the campground, you wanna have a little bit of acclimatization to the high altitude. So that's two nights at North Rim Camp. 47 bucks Canadian. Then you've got to have, so I picked Bright Angel Lodge. So if you're lucky enough and you actually get in the lodge, one of the cheaper rooms, it's 154 Canadian. Nice warm bed, hot shower waiting for you right off of the trailhead on the south side. And then the hotel stay the night before you fly home. So a cheaper hotel at Phoenix airport, you're looking at about 100, 100 bucks Canadian. But $150 in gas if you got a small car, 
$200 in food per person over five days. So that's eating out at Bright Angel. You pick up some groceries for camping, like 66 bucks in gift shop goodies. So a shirt and some stickers and your Trans Canyon shuttle, which is $90 US person. That's $120 Canadian. So if you're doing a rim to rim south to north, your shuttle back from the south back to the north where your vehicle is. So that's 1700 bucks. So if you want to add Phantom Ranch at the bottom, so you wanna go down, stay the night at Phantom, come back up, you're gonna to need to add one more day to your itinerary. And so with your Phantom Ranch stay and one more day added to your car rental, it's about $300 more. So you're looking at two grand. If you wanna stay at, at Phantom, $2,000 per person, Canadian. I've got a little bit of info on the couple of other ways that you can see the Grand Canyon. The mules. You're going to see the mules all over the place when you're in the canyon, whether you're going south or north, you're going to see mules. So their price is for 2019. If you want to ride a mule down to Phantom Ranch, stay one night and come back up the next day. Your price, including your accommodation, a steak supper, your breakfast the next morning and a bag lunch to bring back with you you're looking at $881 to do one overnight by mule. If you want to stay two nights, you're looking at $1,280. So again, your accommodation, two breakfasts, two lunches, one steak dinner one night and one stew dinner the next night, $1,280. This I discovered, I didn't realize you could do this. And I think I want to do this next time we go. You could take a two hour mule ride, which is just kind of along the rim. I thought that was really cool. So you get two hours in the saddle, it's like three hour total duration. So you get six stops along the route for an interpretive info on geology, history, fire ecology, and more. It's along the rim. It's 189 Canadian. So that includes your bus ride and you get a souvenir water bottle. Yay. <laughs> so yeah, we might do that because I, I wouldn't mind seeing what that's like. And it's not crazy expensive. Helicopter. You want to take a helicopter ride into the canyon. They have what's called over the edge heli and boat from the West Rim, which is on the Hualapai Reservation. That's the glass overlook on the West Rim, which is another cost if you want to go and look at it. So you can get about a seven minute helicopter ride each way. So the helicopter brings you down to the bottom. You get out, you go for a 20 minute boat ride and then another seven minutes back up in the helicopter. You're looking at 237 Canadian dollars. That's actually... Not that crazy. I would have thought it would have been way more. When you think, you know, you're going to be down there for 40 minutes, it's like a 40 minute total, 237 bucks. I don't know. That's one of those things that like, you can't, it's a different way of seeing the canyon and to be in a boat and stuff like and that. That'd be neat. For someone that can't hike. Yeah, or, exactly. Or can't, wouldn't want to take a mule. It's a, it's That's right. Alternative. Somebody who just can't get down there physically, this is an excellent option. You're going to see it. There's options to do anywhere from 25 minutes to 45 minutes in the helicopter and you're looking at about 250 bucks for 25 minutes or 330 bucks for 45 minutes in a helicopter and the last thing i'm going to talk to you about is like if you want to take a rafting trip because they do have rafting trips you're going to see rafters down there if you do go down to the river yeah what a totally different way to see the grand canyon so i've got two different types of trips i've got the three to four day upper canyon trip which is uh, Lee's Ferry, which is mile zero to Phantom Ranch. And then you got to hike your ass out Bright Angel Trail. Everything is included from your transport from Flagstaff, all the meals for those days, breakfast, lunch, supper, all your camping equipment and your safety equipment for in the boat. You're looking anywhere from $1,433 to $1,991. And I think that depends on the type of boat. So if you're in a, um, a raft where you're paddling, it's a little bit cheaper. If you're in a motorized boat, it's a little more expensive. I could be wrong, but it just gives it just gave a range in price. It could be the time of year too with that price range. So you're looking at about $2,000 if you want to do three to four days through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River through the rapids and all that stuff. You are going to see the neatest stuff if you do that. They also have what's called the Full Canyon Rafting Trip. This is 13 days of rafting. So you are going all the way from mile zero to the end of the canyon, 270 some odd miles down. Your bus to and from Flagstaff is included. All your equipment, camping, safety, and all your meals are included. If you want to 
paddle your sorry ass with the oars, you're going to pay $5,081 Canadian. If you want the motorized boat that is, they call it a hybrid, so it motors you through the calm spots and you paddle through the rapids, you're looking at $51.55, so $5,155 Canadian. And you know what? I think I would pay the $70 more to be in the motorized boat. And That's on top me. of that, you have to add airfare. Yeah, that doesn't include airfare. And probably a night stay in a hotel the night before. Yeah, because they want you there at like 6 in the morning to pick you up, to take you down to mile zero, to get your butt in to the river. So and You can fly into Flagstaff, which is going to be a little more expensive than Phoenix. But Coast you're not Street. renting a car, you're and it kind of saves you. Yeah, it's just, you have options. Lots of options. So that's it, guys. That was a lot of information. I hope that I have given everybody the information that they need. If you guys have any questions at all, please DM me. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good night.